decipher here. I was honestly expecting to despise this one, guys. I did the research for it, and what I read did not bode well for this movie. Plus, its title was pretentious as all hell. As I said in a previous episode about the movie it purports to be usurping, and the scandal surrounding Nate Parker, the director, producer, and lead actor, made everything seem to point to this movie as being rancid upon delivery. It seemed like Parker, whose name even bears a passing resemblance to the protagonists, was making himself into a messianic figure to save slave women from rape in vindication of his own purported misdeeds. The signs were all there. A brave heart of chattel slavery. And we all know the fidelity of that incoherent trash. But here's the thing, it is surprisingly better. Yet again, this is a movie where the fact checkers went too far. Well, I'm here to set them all straight. Today, I'm going over The Birth of a Nation. No, not that one again, thank goodness. The new one about the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831 in Southampton County, Virginia. But this is not a vindication, because it's not accurate. But not as horribly as Braveheart. Unlike that crappy movie, The Birth of a Nation at least gets the surface dressing correct, and even some much-needed corrections in recent Hollywood depictions of slavery. But the narrative is still corrupted by its inaccuracy. Not much is known about Nat Turner before 1831. What we do know for certain is that he was a slave who grew up on the Turner Plantation, became an itinerant preacher, Listen up, got a preacher here tonight. Come here, boy. Now, he's a nigger like y'all, and he's here to talk to you about the Lord. Maybe a good word from your boy there. Discipline word. Go a lot further than my pistol would. And that he was sold several times. At one point, he ran away, but actually came back, stating that he had a vision about the righteousness of his lot as a slave. A decade after that, he didn't like that lot anymore. He supposedly had a religious vision that motivated him to rebel, and used his itinerancy to organize a secretive rebellion. With the strength of our father, we'll cut the head from the serpent. We'll destroy them all. An eclipse signaled the beginning to Turner. One dark night, they began raiding slave owners' houses, killing every white person inside. Men, women, and children, even a baby in one case, were not spared. After rampaging through 60 white families, the rebellion's ranks had swelled to at least 70 men. Several skirmishes with whites defending their homes ensued, and Turner could not get more slaves to join his cause. A militia was organized and confronted the rebels before they could reach the county seat of Jerusalem, Virginia, which is now called Cortland. The battle was quick and decisive. The rebels were routed, and many fled with their lives, including Nat Turner himself. An orgy of violence erupted in the surrounding area. Whites began to kill black people, be they freed or slave. For seemingly just the catharsis of it, the violence spread quickly, and the number of dead blacks is estimated to be between 100 and 200. Some were hanged, mutilated, and even had their heads mounted on pikes along the roads. One highway still bears the name Blackhead Signpost Road because of this. Turner was eventually found hiding in a hole. He was quickly tried and executed. As a result of these events, and the fact that Turner was a literate slave who used that to become an itinerant preacher, several slave states enacted laws that prohibited literacy for blacks, in a vain attempt to curb such rebellions in the future. It inspired fear in slaveholding states of the possibility of white genocide and retaliation for slavery. They became more heavy-handed in putting down any possible slave revolts until the issue was settled three decades later in the Civil War. Since this was such a major event in U.S. history, there has been a lot of study into it. News media at the time covered it extensively. Nat Turner's lawyer even wrote a popular pamphlet memorializing Turner, and there was much argument about it at the time. There is a great website that has consolidated the primary sources on the subject, linked in the description. Historians have been writing about it since the time of George Bancroft. It is revisited time and again with ever more nuanced interpretation. This is one of those ones that leave very little room for fiction. 
We know a great deal about this event, and the interpretive lens of historians is something most filmmakers, including Nate Parker, are incapable of taking on themselves. But where there is room to maneuver, Parker still gets it incorrect. Before we get into why that is, though, I want to address the historians who have been complaining about the disempowerment of black women in this movie. One called it an epic fail, which has actually affected ticket sales. They have been saying that the movie depicts the rebellion as taking place because of men trying to save women from rape. I said, so for me, my hand to God, I will lynch every one of you. Come on, do you understand? Fetch her. But the movie does not explicitly do that. It shows a montage of abuses before Turner decides over his Bible during his grandmother's funeral. Not only is that excellent filmmaking, using the montage to recall horrors that the protagonist witnessed throughout the story, but it directly shows the religious nature of the real Turner's decision to rebel. They say that the rebellion should also show women helping it along, but the only evidence of that is one black woman being hanged for giving aid to the rebellion. And that could mean just about anything. There is no disempowerment of women here, and the rhetoric given by these critics is badly flawed. It is made clear that Turner's religion was a factor in the movie, as well as several acts of brutality, not just rape. It is true that Turner himself expressed nothing about the brutality of slavery bringing him to rebellion. But given the inaccuracy of primary sources, that is certainly conceivable. This is not the inaccuracy historians should be focusing on, in the slightest. The movie is a biopic of Nat Turner, and it begins his life with a young Nat playing with his master's son. It is made to show that they grew up together, but this was not the case. As I said before, he was sold several times. Benjamin Turner was not Nat's owner in 1831. That was a man named Joseph Travis. Even though Nat Turner testified that Travis was a kind owner, the rebellion killed him and his family. Yeah, how's Cherry? I'm believing she'll be fine. It makes sense to make a composite of Turner's various masters, but that means that the horrors of slave auctions gets pushed off to a different character, whereas it could have been shown with the protagonist. It also omits Turner's running away in 1822 and coming back of his own volition. And that would have made his willingness to preach on behalf of slavery more coherent than in the movie. We need to see his steady turn from preaching for slavery to rebelling against it. And instead, we see him apprehensive of doing so from the onset of his itinerancy. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. The actual fighting of the rebellion was not at all like what the movie depicts. They do not show the slaying of any white women or children, even though the rebels spared no one, save for one lower-class white family that Turner took pity on. They even killed non-slave owners. Turner only admitted to killing one person himself, and that was Margaret Whitehead, a woman. I would say that Nate Parker just didn't want to show women and children being killed, but then he shows just that, with a black kid and woman being hanged during the orgy of violence after the rebellion. Even worse, he shows Turner's own wife still alive after the rebellion. This gives a harmfully false impression of the rebellion, as though it was directed solely at slaves' masters. It was completely racially based. Besides, it is not as though white women and children did not partake in the brutality imparted on slaves. Historians have complained about this movie disempowering women, but here is the movie actively taking steps to make historical women less malicious. Furthermore, the fighting shown is all kinds of wrong. There were a few more skirmishes than are depicted. No slave kid informed on the rebels to initiate the militia to action. They never made it to Jerusalem. nor had any success in battle. The U.S. Army did not get involved in stopping the rebellion itself. In fact, the Army and the Navy were sent in to stop the orgy of violence afterwards. If anything, it is the Army that this movie gets the most seriously incorrect. The federal government essentially tried to save black lives. 
rather than sneakily ambushing the unsuspecting rebels like the movie depicts. The action is fun, and the movie really picks up when it starts, but we really don't need this kind of inaccuracy. Turner is depicted as giving himself up to stop the orgy of violence. He was actually found hiding away in a hole, but this is an allowable inaccuracy. One could simply say that this scene happened when he was being transported after capture, without having to change a thing. But it does give a false impression of heroism. There is kind of a hero's journey to all of this, which is really awkward. Ever since the movie Roots came out, every movie about slavery has to have that whipping scene. I want to hear you say your name. Your name is Toby. What's your name? And this one is no exception. Kendalls are shown behind him as the other slaves show admiration for him. And he even stands up in defiance against the master. That's heavy-handed to say the least. Then, the protagonist gives himself up after the rebellion, despite having ran away from the last stand. When he is hanged, he looks up at the sky and smiles. Well, I can tell you, no one has time to smile when they're hanged. Because hanging doesn't kill you by choking. It's supposed to break your neck. But Hollywood gets that wrong all the time. These scenes are Parker yelling through the screen, saying, Look how meaningful I made this! Aren't I great? Praise me! Come on, Parker. Let history speak for you. These things are silly and are really distracting from what there is actually to praise about this movie. All those inaccuracies being said, there is a lot to be said about this movie's accuracy. It gets the loose organization of the Rebellion perfect, and even its starting signal. It even depicts Turner having a yelling match with a white reverend using actual Bible verses to challenge slavery. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering you again. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger. Beware of false prophets who come dressed in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves! You this shows Turner's religious motivations quite clearly. My favorite thing about this is the general depiction of slavery. It shows that there were differences between the more cruel and kind masters. Cost of breaking them, stealing, sassing, or any other thing, and Earl and I think we're dealing with will be paid for in skin. Got any problem with that? You can stop right now and go on back where you came from. Something that 13 Years a Slave refused to do, despite the source material being very clear on the matter. We even start with Turner being in somewhat of an idyllic condition as a child. Symbolically, when he is made to pick cotton, his hands are bloodied by the thorns. It is as though he is being indoctrinated into the brutality of slavery only steadily, and we see worse as the movie goes along. He has to come to the realization that slavery is inherently wrong, not starting as some sort of moral that everyone already knows. That is damn good storytelling, and we ought to see it more often. I also love the part where Turner had just killed his owner, and as they stare at each other, there is a prominent stained glass cross in the background. The symbolism is obvious and truly effective. The best part is the finale. As a black boy watches Turner being hanged, he lets out a tear. The movie transitions that face seamlessly to him 30 years later, fighting as a buffalo soldier in the Civil War. Holy crap! That just speaks for itself. Awesome. So there are some serious accuracy problems here, obviously. But the movie more than makes up for it with its depictions of slavery and the concluding scene. I wish they would have called it by some other name, because the provenance of the title automatically makes it quite pretentious. Plus, Parker making himself into a messianic figure when he is the director, producer, and lead actor is disconcerting to say the least. So it is a problematic movie, but it is exciting enough to be worth at least checking out. But if not hold it,